Good day. Although I will primarily be talking about phaco trabeculectomy, what I will say can also be applied to other methods of cataract surgery when combined with trabeculectomy. No new earth shattering evidence has come out, but I am just hoping to present a way that will make it easier for us to make better decisions for our patients who need a trabeculectomy. But I would like to highlight the viewpoint from which we should approach the situation. Do we ever have a cataract patient who happens to have glaucoma? No, it's always a glaucoma patient who has a cataract. This is the scenario for this talk. For a patient in whom we know we need to do a trabeculectomy, should we combine that trabeculectomy with a cataract extraction? To be more specific, what if that patient is a primary angle closure patient with uncontrolled IOP, early damage, a significant cataract, and a shallow chamber? Should we do a trabeculectomy alone or combine it with a phaco emulsification? On the other hand, what if the patient is open angle glaucoma, also with uncontrolled IOP, and this time severe damage, and a moderate cataract? Again, what is our choice? How do we come up with a decision? What information do we need so that we can weigh the risks versus the benefits? Let's start with the clinical information. What does the evidence say? How does trabeculectomy alone compare to combined trabeculectomy and cataract surgery and to sequential surgery, meaning trabeculectomy first followed by cataract surgery at a later time? Actually, most of what I'm about to say, you might have already observed in your own patients, and the literature just confirms it. The first thing we should know is that trabeculectomy alone results in better long-term IOP control. However, this is only evidence grade C because the studies included in this review were not randomized controlled trials. The next thing we should know is that FACO-TRAB is slightly superior to ECCE-TRAB at lowering IOP, which is why the title of this talk is TRAB versus FACO-TRAB. I speculate that the separation between FACO-TRAB and ECCE-TRAB is greater now due to improved FACO technology and techniques since the studies included in this review were published. Another thing that we have all probably observed firsthand and that was confirmed in the Advanced Glaucoma Intervention Study is that trabeculectomies tend to make cataracts progress at a faster rate. And something that is very important to know is that cataract surgery done on an eye with a filtering bleb is detrimental to that bleb. So if we must do cataract surgery after a trabeculectomy, we need to extend the interval as much as possible to give the bleb the best chance of survival. What do we need to evaluate in our potential trabeculectomy patients in order to decide if we should combine their surgery with cataract extraction? The severity of the optic nerve head damage will dictate the pressure we want to achieve from the TRAB or the phaco -TRAB. The type of glaucoma is also relevant. Regarding the lens, it's not simply the severity of the cataract that we need to consider. We, of course, need to look at the patient as a whole, a whole visual system and a whole person. I hope that we are all familiar with the European Glaucoma Society's target IOP flowchart. I'm not showing this in order to talk about target pressure but because I think that this is a good way to present the TRAB versus phaco trab decision-making process. We need to ask ourselves, how likely is my patient going to benefit if I combine cataract surgery with their planned trabeculectomy, since we will already be going to the operating room? Since the evidence tells us that trabeculectomy alone produces lower pressures, a patient with severe optic nerve head damage who needs a lower target pressure is less likely to benefit from adding a phaco. Angle closure patients tend to have shallow chambers, which could become even more shallow after we do the TRAB. And removing their crystalline lens 
would mitigate this, so more likely. Anglo-Hosher patients are also more prone to malignant glaucoma, which is much easier to deal with in pseudophagic patients, so again, more likely. Severity of the cataract is obvious, but we also need to think about the need for future cataract surgery if we will only be doing a TRAB now. If, for example, the patient is diabetic and then you do a TRAB, that is now two insults to the lens that could hasten cataract progression. Remember that once we do a TRAB, we have to delay doing the cataract surgery for as long as possible. If we end up being forced to do a FACO too soon after the TRAB, then the result will be worse than if we had just combined the FACO with the TRAB in the first place. Some patients, especially angle closure ones, have very anterior or very thick lenses, causing them to have shallow anterior chambers. So sometimes it might be more prudent to remove the lens in the first place. There are other things we need to consider that are not directly related to the glaucoma or the lens. It may be better to combine the cataract surgery for visual rehabilitation purposes, such as if the eye for surgery is the good eye, or if the cataract is preventing ad adequate posterior pole examination. And of course, we need to consider the patient's general health and fitness for surgery. Sometimes a decision is a no-brainer. If you recall the first example that I mentioned earlier, the patient with uncontrolled IOP has early damage due to angle closure with a mature cataract that is so thick and anterior that the anterior lens capsule is quite close to the cornea. My second example is not so simple. The patient who needs a trabeculectomy has severe optic nerve damage due to open angle glaucoma and has a moderate cataract. But there are no other factors that will induce the cataract to progress faster except for the planned trabeculectomy. His anterior chamber depth is normal. His error of refraction is low, he has no ocular comorbid conditions, and the other eye is the better eye. So it seems this patient would be more likely to benefit from a trabeculectomy alone. However, it turns out that he has multiple systemic illnesses and the medical clearance process has been prolonged and complicated with multiple tests and visits to his internists, and it's unlikely he will be able to get clearance in the future. Where would that leave us when the moderate cataract matures? So maybe this point should look like this. Let's think of another case with many similar features to the previous case. This patient with uncontrolled IOP also has severe optic nerve head damage due to open angle glaucoma and has a moderate cataract. There are no other factors that will induce the cataract to progress faster except for the plantar baculectomy, and his anterior chamber depth is also normal. The patient's error of refraction is low, but in this case, the other eye is blind. Based on the fact that the patient is much more dependent on the eye for surgery to be able to function, he is more likely to benefit from combining the TRAB with cataract extraction. What I'm trying to point out is that the weights of the various factors will always depend on the patient's unique circumstances. And please don't think I have a bias for combined surgery just because all of my examples concluded that FACO TRAB was the better option. It was just easier to present it that way. Once we have an idea of what's best for the patient medically, we now have to make sure the planned procedure is feasible for both the surgeon and the patient or sometimes the clinical facts add up to an equivocal decision, so it's the non-clinical factors that will tip the scales. These factors are mostly patient-related. This is where our listening and communication skills come into play. Occasionally, some of the factors are related to the surgeon. What if the surgeon is not used to combining trabeculectomy with cataract extraction? I would suggest choosing patients who are at the very end of the more likely side of the spectrum for the first few combined cases. What if the surgeon does only ECCEs or no FACO machine is available? 
again, the patients should be closer to the more likely end of the spectrum before deciding to add the cataract extraction. So to summarize, these are the steps that we need to take to be able to decide whether to do a trabeculectomy alone or combine it with a fake emulsification. For those of you who are not yet comfortable combining trabeculectomy with cataract surgery, these are a few tips. And these apply to other types of cataract surgery as well. Thank you for listening, and I hope that this will help you when you care for your glaucoma patients.